What's up guys? Thank you so much for joining me for today's video. My name is Alicia. I am a first year medical student. If you are new here, welcome. And if you are returning, thank you so much for joining me again. Today's video is a video that you absolutely do not want to miss. I have been reflecting on my first semester of med school and just collecting my thoughts on the things that I think would be most important to know before starting med school, some common myths or misconceptions associated with med school and just addressing my experience on those. Now, this is not an exhaustive list. These are just some of the things that really stood out to me. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get into the video. So one thing that I'm so glad I did was just start doing my research well in advance of med school, probably a year to a year and a half out. If you're not already in the application process, this is another thing to be aware of. Honestly, getting into med school starts at least a year in advance. You do all your applications a year in advance, which means you need to have your MCAT scores. So honestly, starting two years out, you need to really be thinking about med school. But anyway, when I say do your research, I mean watch vloggers, um, talk to any current med students that you know, just get the intel on med school. Now this is not to get a total top to bottom rundown of what med school is going to be like because literally no one can tell you that, but this is just to start understanding the things you need to be prepared for. Um, the other thing is you really want to know what resources are highly recommended and how much they're going to cost so that well in advance you can start um, saving up to buy those things. Um, because some people don't really account for all those purchases when they look at how much um, loan money they're going to take for the year. And if it does end up being a hefty sum, which honestly, just three or four resources in one school year can be a significant financial burden. Um, but if you're prepared for that, you can save money. That's something that I was able to do. I worked as a scribe for nine months before school started. And then I also worked an undergrad. So I was just kind of always saving because I just was like, you never know what expenses are going to come up. Um, honestly, most of the resources that are going to be the most effective are going to be pretty expensive. So that's something you want to know early on. I will put prices of some of the most popular resources and some of my favorite resources just so you can get a sense of how much that's going to cost you and you just feel less stressed out when you know that you've saved up and this money is dedicated for these resources. The next thing is, look, there are a lot of people that make the nighttime work for them and they're night owls and I get it. I am not at all a morning person, but I still have to say it makes 10 times, no, 100 times of a difference getting up early and getting your day started. Um, the earliest I've gotten up was around 530 and that was so that I could go to the gym before class and do some studying before I went to campus. And I'm not going to lie, I slacked off on that as the school year went by, but I also saw that my days ended up getting longer. I was feeling more tired. I was feeling more crammed into a day, more rushed. I just felt like, man, my day is just not as productive as it was when I was getting up early. And so towards the end of the semester, I got back to that, getting up early and just getting started. And look, I think it's psychological because when you get up early, you almost feel like there's nothing else to do. Like, it's just so early. I don't even want to watch TV. Like, let me just start working. And you feel very productive once you just kind of get in and go, as opposed to waiting until maybe 10 or 11 to get up. It's like, oh man, I'm hungry. Is it breakfast? Is it lunchtime? And you may decide, oh, let me watch an episode of something really quickly before I get my day started. And you just don't feel as productive. You're not in the mindset of work mode. To me, when I get up later, it, it almost makes it feel like a Sunday. And Sundays are kind of the days where I get to be a little lazy. And so I've just noticed consistently when I get up later, those are the days when I'm studying late into the night till 11 even 12 o'clock and the days when I get up early, like six or earlier, those are the days when I have a free evening. So it's worth it. And like I said, I am not a morning person. So this is coming from someone who hates being up in the morning. You can do it. The next thing that's really important is to set up a dedicated workspace for yourself, preferably not in your bedroom. But if you are limited on space, you can definitely make that work. But don't try to play the middle and just say like, oh, I have this little laptop desk and I can use it when I'm in my bed. You need a desk, a dedicated desk that is your workspace that has everything you need for studying. Um, I would definitely recommend you get a second monitor because having at least three computer screens worth of space counting your actual computer 
you have no idea how efficient that's going to allow you to be. When I just work on my laptop, it takes me forever to do things like watching lecture and making Anki cards or just anything that would take up more space. It just takes me forever when I do it on my laptop versus when I have my laptop connected to my monitor and I have, you know, the big monitor and then the laptop screen. Um, and that setup does not have to be expensive. You don't have to get like a 30 inch monitor. I have a 24 inch monitor. In fact, I will link my desk setup for you guys to look at. That's a relatively affordable one and it does fit in my bedroom because I don't have the space to have a desk elsewhere. But you need a dedicated workspace. Second monitor is definitely highly recommended. And when you work, do whatever you need to do to really zone in. For me, that's putting on headphones, playing the same song over and over. I know it sounds crazy. I can listen to the same song. It's um, The Swan uh, performed by Yo-Yo Ma on the cello. And I put it at a very low volume so that I can still hear myself talking out loud while, I, while I'm studying. But it's almost like that repetitive music and being associated with studying just boosts my um, efficiency and just keeps me very focused and zoned in. Um, I don't like having the songs changing, 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 changing because I will, <laughs> I will be focused on like trying to name that piece and like, oh, that's this by such and such. And it was written in this year. And it's just like, I need my brain to be on default study mode. Okay, so I highly recommend you save up for an iPad. It does not even have to be a really new one. I have Basic iPad functionality is all you really need. The great thing about iPads is a lot of the apps that are amazing for med school are free. Um, and just the ability to have something really portable that you can write on. So I started with the sixth generation iPad, which functionally was absolutely fine. Um, and I think I got that for like $250. There are several sites you can visit. There's Mac of all trades, um, back market and Swappa, all of which are sites where you can buy um, used Apple products. Um, but I did switch from the sixth generation iPad to a second generation 12.9 inch iPad Pro. And it wasn't because of functionality. It was just because I wanted a larger screen so that when I was writing on my lecture slides, the slides were bigger. As long as it's compatible with an Apple Pencil, and if you're okay with your Apple Pencil sticking out of your iPad while it's charging, go ahead and get the first generation if you need to save money. That's what I do. I have an older iPad and I have a first generation Apple Pencil, but at the end of the day, I can take my notes and I can annotate. Okay, so something else that will really, really, really make your life a whole lot easier while you're acclimating to med school is meal prepping or buying healthy pre-made meals. Now, this can get really expensive when you go with meal delivery services. I did try um every plate so the meals on every plate um average between two and five dollars a meal it kind of depends what promotion they're running typically they run the 250 per meal if you're just starting out for the first time i did that for a couple of weeks and i did enjoy it but those meals do take 30 plus minutes to prepare um and for me when i was first acclimating to med school i felt like i did not even have any time to cook I also recommend you get a crock pot because number one, crock pot cooking is kind of fun. You feel like a real adult because you have a crock pot. Also, crock pot cooking is really flavorful and it's so easy. It's usually just you throw everything in there and let it cook for who knows how long and you come back and you have meals for days. Okay, so the last few things I want to talk about are just a few common misconceptions. Some of the things that I thought before med school started that I found weren't necessarily the case. So one of the biggest ones for me was I really thought that I was going to have to sacrifice sleep like in terms of getting maybe three to four hours a night and just always feeling tired and worn down and sluggish. That may be some people's experience but it definitely was not mine. For the most part I get seven to eight hours of sleep a night on a like a bad night where I really really had to study late into the night I get six hours of sleep and even though that's less than the recommended that's not bad to be like a bad night but I do have to say you know that's because I value protecting my sleep honestly I'm not going to be the person that stays up all night or pulls an all-nighter um or just feels like oh if I could just study for three more hours I'm gonna get it like I don't even really study that hard like the day before my test I might review some things that are a little cloudy but I just don't do that where I I just kind of push 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 and say I gotta do it all for the grade I take the approach of I do the work little by little all along the way I try to pay attention to the things that are challenging for me and at the end of the day if one or two days out from the test I still don't know it I'm not gonna know it just because I push myself past my limits so I take that approach some people are not comfortable with that but that's how I do it 
there is time for working out for a social life for your favorite tv shows all of that honestly most of the time i watch one to two episodes of my favorite show every single day the exceptions would probably be if there's like a test coming up or you know a mini board aka a final coming up i may not but honestly like i said when my tests are coming up the day before for the most part i do very light studying and i usually do like watch tv or watch a movie the the day before um but yeah you have time to do that i usually have up to an hour every day to do whatever i'm going to do in terms of you know fitness if it's going to the gym or just walking i have the time for that and i still do keep in touch with my friends you know from before med school it's not an everyday thing but usually on the weekends i have time and honestly another thing that i'm doing with my time is planning a wedding so you know i don't feel overwhelmed i don't feel like i'm drowning in all of the responsibility and like i barely have time for anything during the week you definitely have to be stingy with your time but everything that you put on your planner and on your calendar you will be able to do so you just have to make things like working out things like you know devotional if that's something you do things like um family time you just have to put put it on your calendar and make time for it but you're not going to feel overwhelmed or like you're running out of time if you do put some of those things into your schedule and the very last thing that i want to address is do professors try to make med school hard so i think there are going to be people who just have a certain idea of what med school is supposed to be like and yes they may kind of feed into the narrative of like med school is so hard you're trying to weed everyone out you only want the best of the best but for the most part my experience has been if you were admitted to med school if you even got an interview if you got an interview if you got an email of interest even if you didn't get in that first time someone thinks you have what it takes to go to med school so just stop with the imposter syndrome if you're watching this video you have what it takes to go to med school once you're admitted for the most part your med school faculty and staff is going to want to make sure that you graduate because they don't want people dropping out or leaving the program because that doesn't look good for them in general your professors want you to succeed they want you to learn the information they want you to perform well in step because at the end of the day the better you do the better their school looks so that is all I have for you right now. Like I said, this is not an exhaustive list. This is just some of the things that kind of popped into my head. Um, thank you so much for watching this video. I will see you in the next one, but don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and share. Bye.